Coming up on DTNS, Apple TV comes to Amazon. What Stadia can do that nobody else can. And China alarms reach TikTok. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 24th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Our uh, venerable co-host Sarah Lane is in the midst of the logistics of moving right now, so she will not be with us today or tomorrow, but she'll be back from a brand new studio on Monday. Uh, we were just talking about a little smidge of politics, a little bit of baseball, a little bit of music, uh, all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. You can hear that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitch star Michael Grzyk, a.k.a. Shroud, announced in a tweet that he's leaving Twitch for Microsoft's Mixer streaming platform. His first stream will be on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. The move comes after another Twitch star, Tyler Ninja Blevins, left Twitch for Mixer in August. Blevins commented that Grzyk's move, saying, Massive move for the platform and the streaming industry, which is all words you would expect him to say. Samsung announced that the Exynos 990 chipset built on a 7 nanometer process. The chipset features the male G7 uh, yeah, male uh, Molly G7, Molly G77 GPU and 8 core CPU, both of which are 20% faster than the outgoing Exynos 980. The 990 supports displays with up to 120 hertz refresh rate and up to six cameras with a maximum resolution of 108 megapixels. The chipset does not feature a built-in 5G modem, and Samsung also announced that the 5G Exynos modem 5123, also built on a 7 nanometer with, uh, with support for sub-6 gigahertz and millimeter wave. Mass production on both is expected to begin this year. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, the piece in our time continuing. Apple has launched its Apple TV app on the Fire TV Stick 4K, the Fire TV Stick 2nd Gen, and the Fire TV Basic Edition. So, no, not all the Fire TV models have it yet, uh, but there are more to come. The Apple TV app on Fire OS lets you view your Apple TV and movie purchases, including your subscribe channels, as well as Apple TV Plus content. Uh, at least when that content launches on November 1st, you cannot make purchases through the Fire OS version of the Apple TV app. You can, through the Apple TV on Roku app, make purchases. I just verified that myself moments ago. So that's quite a difference, and it's probably Amazon saying, well, if you're going to take 30% of anything we sell through the Prime Video app on Apple TV, meaning we don't let you make purchases through the Prime Video app on Apple TV, we're going to do something that makes you not want to offer those purchases on Fire TV OS. But at least at least the app is there. Now, this is all part of Apple's strategy of becoming more of a services company. That's why you're seeing them putting their software out on other platforms. Morgan Stanley analyst Katie Huberty released a note Wednesday projecting that Apple's service revenues should grow about 20% next year, what with the growth of Apple Music and the storming of the gates of Apple TV+, Plus, as well as Apple Arcade and, and a few other things, iCloud, etc. Huberty believes that Apple TV+, Plus particularly, will end up being a $9 billion business by 2025. This is the legacy of Tim Cook. Uh, services, internet services in general under Steve Jobs were never a bright spot for Apple. It wasn't something that they did a lot of, and when they did it, it often did not go well at all. Uh, this is a pivot since there are less iPhones being sold. There's less Macs being sold. They can't count on their hardware in the way they once did. And if that's the case, and you are now selling a product that people need to subscribe to, then that means you got to put it everywhere that people are. You can't rely on the Apple install base. While that is a great head start, you can offer a discounted or free version of some of these products if you have the hardware. It's got to be everywhere. Uh, note to the pedants in the uh, audience, when Justin says they're, he, they're selling less iPhones, he means the growth rate is slowing. He knows that. Yes, Please, yes. You don't need to send that correction. We, what's happening is they're making less money off devices, and they are making more money off services, and that's the place to put their money. Uh, and yeah, this is the kind of thing you have to see for Apple to expand. Now, the one I'm waiting for is when I can get that Apple TV app on my Android phone. I can get Apple Music on my Android phone, so I'm not discounting the possibility that that's coming. But once that happens, suddenly, well, why wouldn't I buy things through Apple TV? Now, granted, 
be not being able to make purchases might be kind of key here. Uh, not being able to make purchases on the Fire TV OS is not great. But the fact that you can through Roku means Apple says, well, if the deal's right, we'll definitely let you make purchases. We want to take your money. So I'd be curious if that happens on Android as well. Prediction, we are going to see a price uh, a, a price breakthrough or a, a percentage breakthrough with Amazon and Apple. Uh, that uh, would be a Yeah, this is the kind of thing that'll put pressure on those kinds of deals. Yeah, it's it, it just going to make it easier going forward. Google announced that its game studio for Stadia will be located in Montreal. In an interview with GamesIndustry.biz, studio head Jade Raymond said the studio will focus on making games that do things that dedicated platforms cannot. For instance, Raymond said a fully physics simulated game is possible with reference to the failed attempt at 1998's Jurassic Park tre uh, Trespasser. MMOs could benefit from the fact that all players Sun Stadia are essentially playing in one big LAN party, end quote. She also described games with believable interactions with NPCs drawing on tech like Google's Duplex. One test of this kind uh, will be Orcs Must Die 3, set for spring 2020 on Stadia, where armies of up to 500 enemy monsters cluster in one tight space. Yeah, I mean, this is part of the Stadia hype machine leading up to the launch on November 19th. Uh, but there are some very interesting possibilities if you have a well-functioning, centralized streaming platform like Stadia working where you could do some MMO stuff that when everybody has to be running a piece of the game locally, as they do with most MMOs these days, uh, it, it wears things out real fast. I mean, everybody knows that if you get too many people in a raid, or it, it, it just slows things down and that's why they have to limit stuff. Uh, whereas if it's all happening on one big, big, powerful data center computer, uh, you can do all kinds of stuff that you can't do otherwise. You know, Stadia seems really cool in 2023 there's a lot of talk about all the cool things they're going to be able to do the cool things they're building this mm. is going to make amazing games and we're going to leverage all this technology i swear to god it's definitely going to happen in anywhere between two to three years i'm not a video game expert so i'm not going to put any kind of money or predictions on how stadia will do i am just very interested to see because you know they have to be around the corner in the next week or so, the like, I've been playing Stadia for the past month. Here are my thoughts, early reviews. Yeah, it's funny that in the Game Industry Biz article uh, interview with Raymond, they asked her about, you know, well, when are we going to see this stuff? And she said, well, it won't take four years. Uh, we'll have new stuff rolling out from our studio uh, right from the get go which is kind of avoiding the question of like, yeah, but when does the really cool stuff happen? Well, not four years. So there you go. It's 2023 or before. Justin. Not four years. Not four <laughs> years. Uh, Google launched several new apps from its digital well-being experiments project. Uh, like all app stores, I'm not picking on Google particularly here, but you can't find them easily. Uh, so make sure to not only search for the name, but also the word digital well-being, and then they'll show up. Uh, for example, Unlock Clock is a live wallpaper that will display the number of times you've unlocked your phone that day, if you're trying to keep that down. Postbox is one I've installed. It lets you choose one to four times a day when your notifications are delivered all at once. You can still go in and see your notifications on demand at any time, uh, but the you know, notification aspect that like grabbing your attention aspect is limited. So you're not constantly being pinged by your phone. Uh, Morph is an asp, uh, a, a kind of a launcher that shows you different apps on your screen based on the time of day or location. You can have all your work apps at one time uh, or all of your entertainment apps, you know, in your off hours or on the weekend or when you're traveling, vacation apps, stuff like that. A group game called We Flip counts the amount of time elapsed since anyone in the group has unlocked their phone Kind of a way to, you know, win the game of not using your phone. And Desert Island lets you pick up to seven apps and starts a 24-hour challenge to see if you can stick to only using those apps. Uh, all of this, of course, with people trying to trick themselves into not using their phone so much. <laughs> what a what a fun, strange trend that we are What a in. world we live in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we live in a society. Uh, yeah, well... <sighs> I mean, the information you put into your body and the attention you give to things bears a lot of resemblance to food, right? It's like, ah, oh, I can't stop myself, but I know it's bad for me. Sure. 
and and it just it demonstrates how few players comparably there are in this ecosystem when the food manufacturers are running <laughs> their own diet programs, right? Uh, uh, this is, uh, I mean, I, I'm excited for anybody who gets value at it, but uh, man, just as a large scale thing, the fact that this is the big push of our technology manufacturers is trying to remind you of how harmful their products are uh, is is just interesting. Listen, we know you're addicted to our product, but we don't want you to be harmed by it or you'll stop buying it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, wh one thing I will say, um, a lot of these sound great in theory, but when you try to set them up, you realize just how much thinking you have to go into. I, I was setting up Morph, and I realized, ah, oh, crap, I forgot to put email <laughs> into my work screen. Uh, you know, like... You you have to do some 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 thinking, and I and I think that might be too much of a barrier for a lot of people. Yeah, because really, you just want I want less time on my phone. Let's let's build a suite together of some of these things, and just say just less. I yeah. want I want to drive down my screen time uh, in all the world of machine learning and the tools that you can build into the OS. How can we make that happen? I, that's why I like Postbox. Postbox is a good one because you can choose one to four times. You can get the notifications when you need them. Uh, if you're like, wait, did I get get a note about that yet? Um, but it it also stops your phone from pinging all the time. Better thing is just turn off notifications for everything except the stuff you're sure you absolutely need. I, I feel like notific people having notifications on is one of the worst things for your attention. And man, Android really like wants you to leave notifications on. It it tricks you into leaving notifications on, so it's not good. Twitter announced that it earned. Five cents per share in Q3 on revenue of 824 million, up nine percent on the year. Analysts had expected revenue of 874 million of earnings of 20 cents on the share. Twitter cited problems with its ad tech and a slow summer as causes of the revenue miss. Monetizable daily active users, however, rose 17 percent to 154 million beating expectations of 14 percent ad revenue increased eight percent on the year to 702 million twitter also said that machine learning flags have remo uh, removed 50 percent of abusive posts before they are even reported by users look we're solving the problem before people can complain. 50% of the time. 50% of the time, Tom. It works every time. Every time. Uh, yeah, this would be a really great uh, earnings report for Twitter, right? Uh, uh, it, it The big thing with Twitter has been, are you increasing users? And granted, they changed how they report the users to only the users they sell ads to. Uh, because, But I think that makes sense. I think that's justifiable. So, yes, up 17% on the users that you make money on. That's a that's great news for Twitter. Mm, granted, it's only 145 million, which is smaller than Snapchat's audience. But okay, uh, you got to start somewhere, I guess, uh, in your recovery. But your ad tech being the thing that brought you down, because otherwise they, they made more money. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they made the revenue. They just didn't get to charge for all the ads because they had three different problems with three different aspects of their ad tech selling. That's, that's, not, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Whose head's on a pike for that, right? I, I kind of feel like when that's the reason why you've missed your revenue projections, then you have to like march three people out in front of Wall Street. And uh, uh, I don't know, execution might be a little grisly. So maybe you just, you know, uh, uh, delete their accounts. Termination would be the grisly word that would apply because it just means they lose their job. <laughs> well, you could say termination and then sell an ad for Terminator Dark Fate and try to make up for that money that they lost over the summer. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. I just, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds uh, on the actual ad tech uh, that went bad, but it was like their mobile application promotion product uh, had a bug. Uh, they, they had ad tech personalization wasn't operating as expected, which gave bad numbers. Uh, it, it, oh, so, so, so they had to do give backs or they had to do like make goods. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, that's brutal. I mean, this is, this is the stuff that they should have nailed down after the many years of doing this. Uh, so, so that's, that's unfortunate because otherwise they flipped the script and, and, uh, and said, Hey, yeah, we're, we're growing our users. Uh, and yes, largely because they changed the way they report those users. But if these are the users that make the money, those are the users you want to grow. So it's good to see yeah. them growing them. 
Uh, Twitter, you know, you <laughs> fascinate me with your small yet plucky way of making money. Well, <laughs> well, the good news is, is that uh, at least of those monetizable un uh, users, they still have every reporter in America abroad. <laughs> Uh, the BBC has published a version of its international news website accessible on the Tor network in an effort to help readers avoid government censorship and surveillance. The site is the international version, as seen from outside the UK. Uh, there are foreign language services like BBC Arabic, BBC Persian, BBC Russian available as part of that. But UK only content, you know, like BBC iPlayer, will be unavailable. That's the licensing restricts them to only offering that within the UK. The site can be found at BBC News V2VJTPSUY.onion. Uh, this is, a, a lot of people call it a, a dark web website, but it's a site that means you can access the BBC without having to leave an end note. Uh, when you go out and grab something from the rest of the internet from a Tor browser, you have to go out through an end note. And which end node you pick is very important because that's where someone can potentially track down who you are. If you don't have to leave the end node because it's end to end encrypted, you're much better protected. So this is this is a safer way for someone to read the BBC if they're in a situation where just reading being seen as reading the BBC would be dangerous to them. And there are plenty of those places because yes. the internet becomes more and more of a viable everyday part of the global uh, uh, experience. You find out that there are many governments and uh, non-governmental organizations that are very protective about what goes in. Talking about uh, uh, you know information being food, right? There are certainly some very restrictive diets around the world. Yeah. Roger pointed out that uh, BBC on the shortwave uh, was was for large parts of history a great way for people to find out what was going on in the rest of the world uh, when they lived in a regime that that you know clamped down on the news. Uh, and this is the BBC carrying on that tradition uh, by trying to find a a safe way that that people can can read their their coverage. So good on them. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. U.S. Senators Chuck Schumer and Tom Cotton sent a letter to the U.S. Director of National Intelligence Joseph McGuire requesting an investigation into possible national security threats from TikTok. Yeah, with the music and the memes and all of that. Senator Marco Rubio wrote to Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin earlier this month asking the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to investigate TikTok for national security threats and censorship. TikTok told The Verge it does not have details on the request, but... TikTok is committed to being a trusted and responsible corporate citizen in the U.S., which includes working with Congress and all relevant regulatory agencies. That's the thing they have to say. They said the thing they had to say. TikTok guidelines told moderators to censor any content that refers to Tiananmen Square, Tibetan independence, Falun Gong. Uh, this was discovered in September by The Guardian. And ByteDance, which owns TikTok, said those are old guidelines. We retired those a long time ago. In May of this year, we were totally retired those guidelines. Uh, and now TikTok takes a localized approach. They have different guidelines for each market based on what the norms are in that market. Now, if you're wondering about TikTok being a Chinese company, it's not quite that simple. ByteDance launched an app called Douyin, D-O-U-Y-I-N, in China, September 2016. It hit 100 million Chinese users within a year, and it's still there under that name. In September 2017, ByteDance decided to go international, and the international version of Douyin was TikTok. Uh, that was not terribly popular until... November 9th, 2017, when ByteDance bought Musical.ly. Musical.ly was a Shanghai product that was also based in Santa Monica. So it was a more worldwide product. And in August of 2018, Musical.ly and TikTok merged. And so all of the Musical.ly people flooded into TikTok and instantly made it hugely popular, uh, in addition to the TikTok audience, which, which had been building over that time as well. Now, as I mentioned, Douyin is a separate app for China. Up until the merger of Musical.ly and TikTok, TikTok was mostly a Chinese operation. Uh, ByteDance had, had some international uh, popularity, kind of in Southeast Asia. And so I find it totally believable, Justin, yeah. That that ByteDance would have had one manual created for Douyin, 
uh, and just copied it over for TikTok because, well, you know, we're not that big internationally yet anyway. Let's not waste the time on that. And in May of this year, started to realize, crap, since August, we have blown up when we merged Musical.ly. The Musical.ly folks have different moderation guidelines. We need to clean up this documentation. But of course, The Guardian gets a hold of it and says, hey, look at all this stuff that would make perfect sense for Yan because it's in China. But it seems like it was applying to other people. Now, you have to connect the dots there to say, oh, that was a cover-up. They wanted those moderations to apply. And then further say, even though they say they got rid of it in May, they're still pushing it. And I'm not sure there's evidence that that is happening. So how much of this announcement by Schumer and Cotton is, do you think, based just on the headlines? And how much might be based on something that they know that we don't? All right, here's there's one more vector for those of you who are aware of TikTok the product, and that is that the primary way that they want you to experience TikTok is not how we experience uh, uh, other social networks where you find people that you like and you follow them, like on Twitter when you start a, uh, an account, they give you a bunch of uh, accounts that other people like, and you can maybe pick different interests, and then they'll surface other accounts that you follow. TikTok wants you to algorithmically uh, serve you videos. As soon as you open that app, it just starts playing videos before you even have an account. It doesn't ask you to sign up for an account. It just starts playing videos. And then the more you watch it, the more it recognizes by machine learning, this is their pitch, which ones you like and which ones you don't. So it makes it even harder to say, well, geez, my my uh, 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 mashup of Falun Gong history with Zach Fox's "I Got Depression" uh, uh, is is certainly not making the for you uh, section that's being serviced. That being said, there is an old saying in Washington D.C. that the most dangerous place in the district is between Chuck Schumer and a camera. <laughs> He, uh, this is like being between me and a slice of pie. I get it. Exactly. You, you, you have no idea what kind of ferocity uh, uh, will will come between you uh, uh, between those two those two items. And this is because Chuck Schumer has not been shy about attaching himself to any and all uh, uh, different issues that uh, you know will will get press. You know, when I was. Uh, in my 20s, living in New York City, it was the Feng Hua buses, the, the Chinatown to Chinatown buses that were largely unregulated. And then guess who stepped in to offer guidance or threaten legislation? Indeed, it was Chuck Schumer because that was a popular thing at the time. There is a bipartisan effort in a very unbipartisan time right now to look into China. Obviously, economically, we're seeing it from the White House, but also culturally, we are seeing an uncomfortable uh, uh, recognition of what happens when American companies, let's say, you know, for the most popular example, uh, Blizzard and the NBA, how they interact with China and whether or not they are censoring or affecting their product for the money that China can bring in. This is an even closer tied uh, a situation, but I do think that this is more of a let's review what they're censoring situation in the same way that we would look at Blizzard or the NBA and less of a Huawei ZTE. I think that this is, you know, a, a part of uh, the Chinese government to uh, build a back door into American society. Which is why it's weird that it's a letter to the director of national intelligence to me. Uh, when Rubio wrote to Mnuchin, I'm like, oh, well, this is this is very clearly the United States uh, waging a little bit of soft economic war with China. Uh, and you can argue that TikTok deciding to make the moderation and being based in China could be, you know, pushing its own point of view. It's funny to me that what we want is our tech companies to moderate more. And TikTok's like, yeah, no, we totally do that with machine learning and it's like yeah but you're chinese we don't like that but i get that what i don't get is the security risk i'm not quite sure what's going on on tiktok that's a security risk although there have been some rumblings that there's you know some terrorist uh propaganda being pushed out on tiktok but like you say it's hard to find that kind of thing because yeah. you can't just go and let you know isis can't just go and push it out to all their followers right 
Well, you can search by user, but it is a fundamentally different experience than, uh, let's say, YouTube surfacing. Guess who made a new video? Now, that might show up algorithmically in your main feed, or you might go search that person every day. But it's it's a fundamentally different experience on TikTok, which does make it more insidious because you could, again, have a whole thing about uh, Tibetan independence and – you don't know for a fact whether or not it got the kind of run that it would have otherwise. Yeah, and if 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 that can't make it, I'm guessing Daesh videos don't make it either. But you know, it's uh, it's 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 interesting because I think there there are some legitimate concerns about obviously what gets allowed on social media, whether it's Facebook, TikTok, or what else. Uh, but there's also a little China fever going on that sort of clouds the view of it. Uh, and it's it, and it's getting harder and harder to to see through that fog, especially when you're standing between Chuck Schumer and a camera. Like, well, and that's and that's the other thing is that culturally, right now, there is a global or not a global, a national question of what our relationship is and should be with China in terms of entertainment. It's yep. it's global. I mean, w, it's, it's w. Definitely... Scott is one in our chat room says uh, there was a school where students influenced uh, a contract with the union to get teachers better pay and videos blew up on TikTok. So, yes, TikTok it can have effects on things. I don't think we're debating that. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, and TikTok, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, my favorite meme in TikTok is uh, these teenagers with their first job right at Pizza Huts and Panera Breads shooting TikToks of how they're doing their jobs and getting fired because the corporate overlords don't like like the corporate overlords at Panera don't like the fact that a 14 or I guess a 16 year old is showing that they microwave their uh they microwave their their macaroni and cheese uh indeed indeed uh thank you to all those who participate in our subreddit you can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, Chance wrote in and said, I absolutely love Firefox due to their privacy priority, but I'm a web developer too. We had a web developer write in about this yesterday. And I want to tell you, animations just don't work in Firefox. I love animating web pages above all things. It's freaking great, but they don't work in Firefox. It's horrible. If you don't believe me, go to a sample blog page I made at chancethehacker.com. Great name. Uh, and click the fun tab and compare between Chrome and Firefox. It's no contest. Anyway, Hope you like the cat pics I sent. And yes, Chance, we absolutely did. Uh, also, I did. I went to the the page he was talking about in both Chrome and Firefox. It works in Firefox, but it doesn't work well. It's kind of like slow, chunky animation, whereas on Chrome, it's like super fast and super smooth. My question to the audience is, okay, if you're a developer and you want to make something cool, it looks like, yeah, Chrome definitely has a lot more tools for you. But if all of us are choosing based on other Problem, other concerns. Is it bad for us to go choose Firefox? And if we do, does that help you put the pressure on Firefox to make better tools that do this sort of thing? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because I, I don't think a general user should not pick Firefox because a developer might not make a cool animation for it. I guess that's where I'm headed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, it's it's the overall user experience. And if it's harder for developers to work on it, then it will eventually erode user experience. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Andy Beach, Martin James, and Bjorn Andre. Thanks to you, Justin Robert Young, for being here. Oh, Tom, always a pleasure. It is the highlight of my Thursday. And I'll tell you what, hopefully, after you're done listening to this, you can head on over to the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast because my guest talking all about Brexit is Tom Merritt. Uh, I think we had, a, I've gotten a lot of great praise uh, uh, for uh, us being able to break down what is a very complicated process as best we can uh, and make it at least digestible. So if you've Kind of, you're aware of Brexit, but you, you keep finding it confusing, and there's too many people that you don't know, and then amendments to laws that have amendments that then go to another country to decide whether or not they could be law amendments. Then listen to the politics, politics, politics show. 
yeah. Uh, if if you like this and it goes well and Brexit happens, uh, look forward to, uh, in a couple of years to my appearances on Politics, 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 talking about the Treaty of 1707 and Scottish independence. I can't wait uh, to dig into that as well. <laughs> it is adorable that you would assume that Brexit will ever end. We have new Patreon rewards, folks. Uh, become a member of DTNS and get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. That's one of the new rewards. You can just watch us building the show every day, and it gives you access to all the previous tabs if you want to go back into the show notes and do a little control F and find stuff. Uh, these are delivering November 1st. And also on November 1st, everybody who is at the $2 level or above gets a PDF copy of the official DTNS cookbook. Scott Johnson just sent me uh, the line art for the cover, so it's coming together. And we're going to be delivering it next week. You got to be in at the $2 level by November 1st, patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, yes. And of course, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morrison, Len Peralta, illustrating the show. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>